Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their history, their music, the group years, the solo years, what's ever going on in the in the news these days. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the regular co-hosts of this show, also known for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and a video podcast, a relatively new one that's also bi-weekly uh, on Facebook called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by on the show uh, two of my regulars, our uh, resident musicologist who writes for Beatle Fan, the Wall Street Journal, lots of different publications, also is the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and the ebook, Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. Also joining us is a man who has been part of New York Radio on New York's WFUV for now over 35 years. He is their Beatles expert there at the channel, has done a lot of great work on the station, interviewed many different people, and that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, everyone. How, how, how is everyone doing? Our program this time out is something that uh, I would say is extra special because this particular program marks, believe it or not, our 300th episode, which is really hard for me to believe. Um, and so I thought, because this was a very special moment in the history of this show, I thought that it would be only right to bring back two very important people that was a part of this show. First of all, the man who started the show with me, who you've known for many years as uh, being the leading guy on the internet when it comes to Beatle news, who does it on a regular basis, on a daily basis, going all the way back to the Abbey Road website, to Beatles Examiner. And he has a, a relatively new audio program on the news that's heard on Fab Four Radio. And that's Steve Marinucci. Welcome back, Steve. Wow. Thank you very much, Ken. And thank you guys for inviting me. And hello, everyone. Well, it all started with us. So, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, and sorry for doing this, you know, on the spur of the moment. Do you remember exactly when we started? About what month and year? You know, I didn't look it up, but I know it's, I think I've looked it up in the past and I'm shocked at how long ago it's been. Um, it's, it's been, it was a long time ago. I mean, it's like, I'm sitting here looking actually at the, the Podbean webpage, and I think the uh, it actually says uh, October 2012. I can't believe it's that far. Uh, I, I really can't. Yeah. But that's apparently when it was. Pretty so. amazing. So yep. welcome back, Steve. Thank you. And also, we have brought back someone who was part of our show for many years. He's the senior editor for Beatle Fan Magazine and has been so since almost its inception. He's written many great articles through the years and a few years ago wrote a book called Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Let's welcome back Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Gentlemen, how are you? And hello there, everybody. It's great to have you back here, Al. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So what we're going to do on the show this time, uh, first of all, we'll start with Beatle News. I know that Steve got to see Paul McCartney live in concert in San Jose which he'll be talking about. And we're also going to be talking about whatever any of us have to say about the new Paul McCartney reissues of live material. There were four titles that just came out on uh, July the 12th. We'll talk about that. And then I thought all five of us would do a couple of things that I think uh, would be kind of special. We'd look back and just mention a few shows that we feel are our favorites from the very beginning of the show to the present. And um, and then we're going to also close the show with each of us talking about our three biggest moments, Beatle moments, in our own lives. What impacted us the most in our lives? It could be anything. It could be seeing the Beatles on television, on the Ed Sullivan show. It could be a certain album. It could be something with the Beatles group years. It could be something solo, you know? It could really be anything. So I'm curious to find out what you guys have to say on that particular topic. 
But we'll start with the latest in Beatle news, and there's quite a lot to get to here. But uh, to start off with, Paul McCartney ended his Freshen Up tour with the show at Dodger Stadium in L.A., and he had a few special guests to join him on stage. Ringo Starr came out and drummed behind Paul for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and also Helter Skelter. And Joe Walsh came on and jammed at, uh, at the end, uh, trading guitar solos for the song, The End, with Paul and the band. So who would like to comment on this? I guess you've all seen this online, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's. I mean, he usually does something like that at the end of his tours anyway. I'm only sorry that he didn't do something in San Jose, which was the gig before that I saw. But but um, that, that that was great that he that Ringo came out like that. So anyone else? Not especially because <laughs> what can the you say, thing, really? You know, it's, yeah, because it's, it's it's not as if. Uh, they haven't worked together. In fact, uh, actually, it's uh, apparently one of the reports said something about, the, oh, they haven't worked together since the Beatles, which, yeah. is, which is ridiculous because mm. I think that they haven't worked together in about, I don't know, six months, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny every time something like this happens, the way the people who don't really know about the Beatles write yeah. about it. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. you, you know, you see the word, of course, reunion, like it's never happened before. Mm -hmm. They've never, they've never ever gotten together, and they never will again. Yeah, and it's and everybody looks at it like it's the Beatles as a group, which of course it's not. And it's it's you know, I, it, how do you how do you, you deal with that? You don't, I guess. You just kind of go, okay, you know, you just sigh and, and go with it. I mean, and you think you know, to yourself. It, Millennials. Yeah, well, exactly. I guess, I guess, I guess uh, yeah, I guess that's it. But it's not. But remember too, Alan. It's not just millennials. I mean, you get the media in general doing that. And, and I, I, I understand what you're saying about millennials in the media today. But it, it's everybody doing that. I mean, yeah, that's true. I, think even, I, think, I, I, I honestly didn't read, and I hope he's not listening, Randy Lewis. But I'm sure. Randy Lewis said reunion, and Randy Lewis is no, you know, millennial. So, mm. you know. Well, it, it is a reunion of two Beatles. That's all that it is. Yeah. And, you know, it still is regarded to, to many of us as being something special. But they are, you know? but they get together, uh, they get together. Yeah, all the know, time. Because somebody told me that Ringo, I mean, that Paul showed up for Ringo's birthday party. So it's not like they never see each other. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, that, I, I mean, to say it's a reunion like it never happens is not true. No, that's wrong. That's definitely wrong. And, um, in fact, somebody said it's the first time that the two of them have been in the same venue performing. Oh, my God. Now, that's, that's, and that's wrong. Ringo 70th City. birthday. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, there's so many instances where I mean, even that CBS show, the CBS right. show, right? Right. I mean, Our, you know, just, just last year they were. Uh, I forget which which tour it was, but uh, one of them, one of them appeared, and and they've recorded together. I mean, they were yeah. Paul. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's crazy to the. I mean, it's it. You know, you can understand the dramatization and the and the way they want to hype it up, especially mm. for you know for online but it's you know you just kind of every time this kind of happens and i you know i just kind of you know oh no here we go again and and you know i just kind of shrug it off but you know you can't get away from you know so no it's just for me it's nice to see i mean i'm not the type of person that wishes for reunions but the thing is when you watch this on camera and you see how certainly during helter skelter Ringo is smiling. <laughs> He's got a smile a mile long. He's really enjoying himself. That alone is worth watching it for. So, and like it or not, they're the only two Beatles left. And anytime the two of them do anything together, that's going to make the news. Oh, sure. So mm -hmm. That's just the way that it is. So it's nice when they do these things, even if it's once a year or once every few years. So I don't wish for it all the time. But it, it is nice when it happens, and it's nice to watch it on video on camera. Does anyone remember? Uh, I was at the show. Ken, you were at the show. I know that. Yep. 
uh, I don't know if anyone else, Al, if you were there. I was there. Ringo, oh, you were there, Steve. When um, uh, you Ringo's seventieth birthday. No, I wasn't. I, I was wasn't there. there. I was at that. Right, I, I was there. Seventieth uh, birthday at Radio City Music Hall. McCartney came out, and that was something special. Mm-hmm. And um, in fact, he was sitting just a few rows behind me, and I didn't know that. Yeah. At the time, uh, and then the stories came out that people were recognizing him, and he was shushing everyone because he didn't want yeah. the secret to get out that he was there. But anyway, mm-hmm. when that happened, that show. Does anyone remember? Any national coverage that Paul came out for a Ringo show? Mm, Only uh, I after, thought it was maybe, pretty well maybe, covered. Yeah, maybe you after mean specifically the sp- specifically mentioning that that Paul had played for the first time at a Ringo show. Is that is that what you're asking? Because I mean, everybody everybody mentioned w- the circumstances of it. Yeah, I, I don't know how much like you know network like national network coverage. I don't remember how much you know it may be over the uh, because it was if i remember it was on a friday night so i think over that weekend there wasn't you know much in the way of like network tv coverage of it or or whatever because i don't know how much of the media had been alerted to this maybe happening i don't Mm. remember being alerted to it (laughs) yeah yeah well that's yeah exactly that's that's a good example well remember it did start to sneak out before that he was in the area i mean it, before he went on stage the word got out that he was there yeah mm. and there were the stories that came out later that he had talked to fans and stuff so he i mean he didn't entirely stay hidden under a cover oh no not at all and nobody yeah. would see him but it the word really really didn't for those inside the arena i don't think there wasn't much yeah, I mean, it was pretty much a surprise, I, I, I'm guessing, to you guys that were in the arena, that you didn't know he was going to be there. No, right? no, I mean, you heard no. rumors and, you know, some chatter, but uh, didn't know for sure. But mm-hmm. wait a minute. So, like, three of the five of us were at that show? Mm-hmm. I mean, what yeah. are the odds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Paul sat behind me, and I didn't realize it. We were I sitting together. Wife. We can. Yeah. You kept putting your hand on my knee. I remember. (laughs) No, actually, Ken and I were sitting together. We were towards the back, and I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I don't recall once the show was over. I think we found out, or at least I did. He was sitting over here, and he had been discovered, and and I was annoyed at myself for not turning around for two hours, you know, or Mm -hmm. I would have seen him because we were just a handful of rows away uh, at Radio City. I think I even had to quickly get up and use the men's room and would have all I needed to do was pay attention to the world, my surroundings. And I would have seen mm. him and I didn't, you mm. know, I just made a beeline to get back to, you know, as quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. But the best part about that was that Ringo was unaware of it all that time. Yes. They were doing everything they could to make sure he, he didn't know at all. So he must have been, if there were any reports on television at all, they kept that from him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, TV out of his uh, dressing room. And the band started birthday and Ringo wasn't there and he had to run onto the stage and go onto the drum set. Right. So that that's proof that he didn't know Paul was going to be there. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> so, but that was nice. But anyway, it, it's, it's nice when this does happen every now and then. And, um, you know... Just from my point of view, I don't expect anything like this to happen. I'm grateful for anything that Paul and Ringo do now, whether it's making a new album or performing live. And if something like this makes the two of them happy, then I'm all for it. And it makes a lot of other people happy, too. Absolutely. Anyway, more news. And for some of us, this could be the biggest news of the past week. Um, While we're waiting for the official statement, Word has leaked out about the upcoming Abbey Road box set to celebrate its 50th anniversary. A super deluxe edition will include three CDs, a Blu-ray, and a hardcover book. The three CDs would consist of the first disc being a new remix of the album, the other two CDs being demos and outtakes. The Blu-ray would have a Dolby Atmos mix of the album, a 5.1 surround sound mix of the album, and a high-resolution stereo mix. And in the book, Paul McCartney has contributed 80 never-before-seen photos 
taken by Linda from the studio sessions, and Kevin Howlett has done most of the writing for it. So, in addition to the super deluxe version, just so that we know we're covering here, there'll be a deluxe version of two CDs, one with the remix of the album, plus one CD of demos and outtakes. Abbey Road will also be available as one CD of the new remix. There'll be a three LP box set with the remix and two albums of demos and outtakes. There'll also be a 180 gram vinyl edition of the remixed album. Uh, plus, this will be available in non-physical formats for purchase or streaming. And it's strongly rumored that both Paul and Ringo will be attending a listening party at Abbey Road's number two studios. And they're giving the date for August 28th. And I happened to check on Ringo's website, and he's actually doing a concert in Oakland on the 28th. Hmm. Mm. But as you say, this is unofficial words. So. And, 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 and I think, and that's the big point here, is that it is unofficial. And, you know, I, and I hate to, I know Bill King put out a, a big thing of it, and so did a couple of other people. But it seems to me that every time these things have come out like this, they haven't always been accurate, whether it's been dates or, or information. And I'm not paying a whole lot of attention to to that track list to be honest with you i'm i just i would much prefer to wait for the the official announcement um mm -hmm. i mean yeah that's just the way that's just the way i'm feeling um i mean the the one thing from the the, the one thing that i noticed that wasn't mentioned and it, of course it would never happen would be a full down mono mix <laughs> Which would be kind of funny because I've been I've been listening to mono mixes of other album old albums recently, but that would be um, that would be interesting. But it's obviously not going to happen. But but I I, I just want to say that too that you know uh, a lot of times in my experience with with these advanced you know track lists, I remember the new track lists that got circulated very wi widely, and I went to you know sources and they said no 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 it's not right and it wasn't so mm. yeah anybody yeah. else want to comment well the uh, i mean uh, obviously uh, i think the information you have comes from from beetle fan right and uh and uh, you know we have two at, at least two alan I don't, I don't know if alan is one of our sources but i know we have two very good sources so, but you know, there uh, still is completely unofficial. So, uh, so I, you know, we'll uh, we'll just have to uh, just have to wait and see, right? right. Uh, but I would say, uh, you know, that it's it's you know pretty pretty solid information. You know, not a hundred percent, but uh, certainly as far as the material, you know, that'll be on the uh, on the sets. I think it's relatively, relatively solid. It's solid. I, and I, I think that the logic of the the new mix and the and the outtakes is just kind of almost a no brainer given what. Oh they've yeah, done or and considering mm -hmm. well, yeah, exactly what they've done with Sergeant Pepper and with the White Album, exactly. And I'm really anxious to hear, you know, that new mix. That ought to be. I mean, because Abbey Road was already a, had a great mix on it. It's yes. Gonna, going to be amazing to hear yeah. if Giles or what Giles has done and by the way Ken you didn't mention the the tweet that Giles did with the recording oh yeah, yeah. and said the love you make is equal to or uh, 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 never mind well whatever but i mean <laughs> the love you take is equal to the love, you, to make. love you make yeah i you know, i i said that I, I said that on my my show too and i screwed it up but <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, so the, the hints are there. I mean, there's no question that the hints aren't there. So yeah. mm -hmm. I'm I mean, just—I'm actually surprised they're not doing "Let It Be." I, I kind of, unless they're waiting until after Abby. Well, Rock. They're, obviously, they're waiting for next the year Jackson for film, yeah. yeah, exactly mm -hmm. for the film and and also for the actual anniversary of mm -hmm. of "Let It Be." And you know, if it does come out in May. Which would be the anniversary. Right. That's not too long from now. No. So it's not like a, a year wait in between. Mm -hmm. nope. So, um, you know, between a box set of, of unreleased material and the new movie and remastering the old movie, that's going to be quite a lot <laughs> mm -hmm. coming out within a very short period of time. So, 
Mm-hmm. So if this news is accurate, if uh, the release date we've been given for the Abbey Road reissue is September 27th. Let's cross our fingers for that. One more thing. I hope they do a listening session uh, in L.A. again. Uh, maybe uh, somebody will show up to that one, too. Mm. How about one in Pittsburgh? <laughs> or Portland, Maine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, heard, I heard Maine is what they're looking at right now. Yeah, uh-huh. right. And only Maine. That's right. That's right, because my 5.1 system is approved by none other than Mark Lewis. And so yes. what can you do? Okay. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> All right. Other news due to the success of the film yesterday. Five Beatles songs have entered Billboard's Hot Rock Songs charts. Here Comes the Sun at number nine. Let It Be at number 12. Yesterday at, at 14. Hey Jude at 16. And Come Together at 17. Not only that, on the Billboard album charts, you should be doing this, Steve. You're Mr. Billboard. Beatles 1 is the number 43 album in the country. Gee, Abby what a Road. surprise. <laughs> Abbey Road is at 67 and the White Album at 154. Sometime in the future, we have to do a show as to what is it about Here Comes the Sun in this day and age, why it is the number one Beatles track. When when the Beatles were first released on iTunes, Here Comes the Sun was the number one track yeah. that people went to. What is the uh, appeal? I mean, obviously it's a great song, but you could say that about so many Beatles songs. What has happened that you know people seem to love Here Comes the Sun so much more now, apparently, than, than before? Hmm. So we'll save that for a show in the future. Okay, the film yesterday drops to number five in box office sales after an impressive three weeks at number three, grossing over $48 million. Uh, The new issue of Uncut Magazine is out called Introducing Ringo Starr, The Ultimate Music Guide, and it includes in-depth reviews of every Ringo album, a section on Ringo's films, one on Ringo's rarities, and uh, also archived interviews from the NME and Melody Maker, newly discovered i haven't gotten this yet but i'll be on the lookout for it any of you guys pick it up no but i i buy those magazines uh pretty often classic rock uncut prog all of that stuff and it's usually by the time they get here to the states you know it's like a few weeks after they get published and and distributed in, in the uk they can make their way over here so i would be surprised if it's out here it might be but uh and they usually make them available a little more than the monthly, regular monthly editions, I, I believe, mm. of these okay. like artist, com- ultimate artist guides. You know, they're, they're very well done. Yeah, I usually check my Barnes & Noble or Borders for these magazines. So if I do pick one up, I'll make sure that we talk about it on the show. Can I ask yeah. a question about yesterday? How many of you guys have seen yesterday? I have. I have. I, st- I have. Not I. Not I. You haven't, oh, okay. Steve? No, I have not. Mm. I have not. Hey, um, okay. I have, remember, um, last week I mentioned my theory about uh, yesterday and Paul's yesterday and Paul dreaming yesterday and if, you know, he had dreamed yesterday but it actually <laughs> was a song <laughs> and he <laughs> took ownership of it when no one could identify it. Another clue. <laughs> turned up when I caught up with um, an article that um, Dave Itzkoff wrote in the New York Times um, talking to the directors and they had um, written to Paul when they were starting this uh, you know for his these sort of approval I mean they didn't really need his approval as such but they mm. wanted a um, and he wrote back I think a good title for it would be scrambled eggs nah. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think this is lost on him either. <laughs> huh. But uh, I definitely enjoyed the film, Steve. And, okay. Um, you know, we talked about it in our last show kind of at length. So, but um, I would definitely recommend to everyone to see it. Okay. So many well, Beatle fans are very... automatically, uh, they're automatically critical <laughs> before oh, they even God. go and see the movie. They oh. either just, they don't like the premise to begin with which to me was always very Twilight Zone-ish in a way. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a really cool idea. Right. And if, you, if you're looking for all kinds of messages in the movie, don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, a then, Ken, there are yeah. already people critical of Giles' remix of Abbey yes. Road. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, 
It's true. I mean, I've been reading comments on well, on the internet, I, and it's like, give me a break already. You know? When the when the yeah. track listing for the White Album set came out a year ago, and uh, it didn't include the twenty seven minute Helter Skelter. Mm. Oh yeah, it had all never... these all of these morons, all these social media morons. <laughs> so great to have phone. you back, Al. <laughs> <laughs> It's, we, it's, it's, not, it's not worth getting at all. And then it comes out, and what we get is a 13-minute cut of the, you know, of what would have been the 27-minute Helter Skelter, which is nothing but a, a interminable, you know, shuffle blues. It's not the, you know, the all-out rocker that the that it eventually became. You know, can you imagine sitting through 27 minutes of, you know, the 13 minute cut that came out? Oh, my God. There are some people who could. And I have a feeling Alan's one of them. Yeah, I could. (laughs) I could. But, you know, I mean, I I think I've told this here before. I, I mean, when the when the anthology one came out, which is an even shorter cut of the same take that they put on the white album super mm-hmm. deluxe um i asked him is the 27 minute version i asked mark uh is it closer to the album cut or the anthology cut and he said it's like the anthology cut and i said why are we all so excited about that yeah thing? you mm. know and and like and he was he started saying well i don't know why you were i don't know why everybody is so excited about that and said, well, wait a minute have you read your book you know the book yeah. makes it sound really exciting <laughs> but that's because we're reading we're for us i mean i don't know what mark was thinking but for us you know we're reading the book and the only helter skelter we know is the album cut so we're assuming that it's 27 minutes of that and right uh, it's not so well yeah what can you do and i thought the store the sergeant pepper box set was really lacking because it didn't have carnival of light Uh. (laughs) (laughs) oh god (laughs) anyway yes let's get on to a few more news items here uh, let's see, Ringo's on the cover of Parade Magazine with a new interview talking mainly about the 30th anniversary of the All-Stars, his peace and love events, and being glad and lucky to be alive, now at 79. Also, speaking of Ringo, his album from 1976, Ringo's Rodeo Viewer, has just been released as a green vinyl exclusive through the Barnes & Noble chain. It's being released on the Friday Music Label, and they've been putting out Ringo's Bad Boy album in various different vinyl releases. I know uh, Darren's probably going to pick this one up. Sure, why the heck not? <laughs> <laughs> I have several of the Bad Boys, and I, I, I was like, I, don't, I have two, two of them. I don't even remember which one was Barnes & Noble and which one was Noble & Barnes or, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to label but- them. Yeah, mm. but you know these releases are coming out mainly for you. <laughs> yes, yes. Also, this is uh, a little more than a week ago. Paul posted a video of him reading from his new children's book, "Hey Grand Dude," which officially comes out September fifth as a hardcover book and also on Kindle. With special thanks to one of our listeners, Alfred Daniel, we learned that Paul appears on a new song on guitar and as co-composer from Australian artist Thelma Plume. And it will be on her new album, Better in Black. Better in Black. I haven't heard it yet, but I'll be looking for it, and we'll talk about it once we do hear it. Uh, Also, Stella McCartney posted a new video for her new fall collection called All Together Now, which actually mixes footage from the film Yellow Submarine with young people wearing uh, her new clothesline and also playing the guitar and drums. You never hear Beatles music in the video, but you see characters like a Blue Meanie and Jeremy Boob is also in it. Anybody want to comment? Y- yes, the, the, uh, you forgot to mention the prices on those, on those clothes. Oh, I can imagine. I think it starts around... I had to. I, I I mentioned this on my show. Somewhere around three hundred dollars to over six thousand dollars. Ooh. I mean, <laughs> well, you can put them in your suitcase from Traveler's yeah. Edition. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> there you go. Good, that's good. Mm. Uh, news about Yoko. She sent out a live video for something called Bells for Peace for the opening of uh, the Manchester International Festival. While Yoko was singing lines about wishing for peace in the world, the crowd participated, shaking their bells and ringing them for peace. So Yoko was actually doing what she's been doing all this time from her days with John through today, uh, spreading the message of peace in the world. And uh, other news, Danny Harrison just released a brand new song called Motorways, Erase It, which is now available on streaming services. He's actually been performing the song on tour as the opening act for Jeff Lynne's ELO. Uh, Swedish singer Chris Clafford wowed the audience on America's Got Talent with a stunning rendition of Imagine, for which he got a standing ovation. I don't know if any of you saw that. Really strong vocals there. And my last news item is that a new film is in the works called Prefab, which tells the story of the band that became the Beatles, the Quarrymen, It'll feature members of the group from 1956 through 59, including Colin Hanton, Chaz Newby, who Steve and I interviewed, uh, Len Gary, and Rod Davis. These four surviving members of the group were recording at the legendary Abbey Road Studios for this film. And of all these members, Colin Hanton has the most significance since he was with them through this entire period. He witnessed John and Paul meeting each other for the first time and when jo uh, George joined the group. So Colin left the group with the nucleus of what became the Beatles, and there's no word yet as to when we can expect this film out. So that's it for all the news I've got for the show this time out. And so now we turn our attention to Steve Marinucci, who just recently got to see Paul in concert in San Jose. Steve, how was the concert? It was really good. I have to, I have to say um, we had really good seats. We were down on the uh, side down at the front of the stage so we had a good we had a good view this was indoors at the sap center in san jose which is the home of the san jose sharks so this is not a, this was not a symphony hall and this the acoustics weren't that great at least where i was sitting they weren't but i mean it, it was it was loud that's for sure and it was funny before the show there was a a trailer going across the uh the top of the uh, arena saying this show has pyrotechnics as if you know anybody in the, in the arena didn't know it <laughs> but uh, it, it started uh, as usual with Paul's shows it started about a half, uh, close to a half hour late but uh, he came out and the roar from the crowd was was amazing I mean of course you know whenever but when you that's one of the, the great things I like about Paul's shows is when he comes out people just go nuts and that's what happened the set list uh, was a pretty standard set list. I, I, I really loved Love Me Do. I thought that sounded wonderful. I liked that whole busking section. I was glad not to hear uh, four or five seconds. Thank you for leaving that out, Paul. But uh, the band sounded great. Because it was an indoor show and because of where we were, Live and Let Die was incredibly loud. I mean, I'm glad I had my fingers over I forgot to bring... Uh, earplugs and I that was a stupid thing to do but I managed to get my fingers in my ears and my wife did too and we you know spared our eardrums because we would have been a mess after that was over um, I'm, and for those that I asked somebody about it until later and he said uh, James Liveriani, James if you're listening uh, he said uh, not loud enough and I'm thinking no 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 I'm too old for that now so I have to <laughs> I got to put my fingers, I got to spare my eardrums, and uh, it was very loud. I could, even at the beginning of the show, actually, it did seem really loud, but it seemed to mellow or tone down. I guess they did something with the sound or something, and it didn't sound so bad after the beginning of the show. At the very beginning, though, it did sound quite loud. But they, I mean, the, you know, the set list was the standard set list. The band sounded great. I loved when Abe uh, danced around. Uh, was that Dance Tonight? He usually does with that song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, that was that was really cute. And the end of the show was was great. Uh, you know, they have the video all synced. You know, synced up with him. The, the video coverage of that show is is always good. And he uh, they, he actually walked toward the camera and blew a kiss to the crowd, which I thought was kind of nice. But it was a great it was a great show. It 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 really was. I mean, there were a couple of spots where his voice 
uh, sounded a little rough. Let it be was one. I uh, I expected maybe I'm amazed to sound rough, and it it really didn't. But um, for the most part, his vo- voice sounded good, and you know it was it was good. And I'm only sorry, like I said, that Ringo didn't show up in San Jose, but that's the way it goes. But still, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I so. know a lot of people have been commenting how much they love the the horn section that Paul added. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the horns. No, the horns were good. They uh, they pop into the crowd. In fact, I had to kind of look around in, through my glasses and go, "Where the hell are they?" And they were. My wife goes, "No, they're halfway down there." And they were. They were, you know, halfway down the arena. So, but yeah, the, the horn section was good. And uh, actually, at one point, you could see the band kind of sm- smiling at each other. I I don't know if it was around when Abe was dancing or, but I saw. Uh, Wicks uh, uh, start laughing. They were all kind of laughing at one point. So I don't know what what that was all about. But anyway, it it was a good show. It was it was very good. So hmm. what kind of songs got the the best reaction? The old, the old, as he said, as he as he told the crowd, he goes, you know, when I do the uh, the old songs, uh, you got everybody goes crazy when you when I do the new ones. Or everybody goes uh, puts up all the uh, the lighters with the you know and the and the phone lights, and when I do the new songs, everybody it's all dark and so the old I mean the old songs always got the got the uh, good reaction. I will say and I and I you know I uh, I've said before that uh, Egypt Station was not an album that I thought was really great, but live. The instrumentation live on those song, on those particular songs sounded better than on the album. Um, I'm still not a big fan of the album uh, and some of the songs, but I thought instrumentally they sounded better live than they did in, on the on the record. So, okay. well, I've heard and, and read different reviews of the tour, and uh, some of them have said that the crowd really responded well to the Egypt Station stuff, and especially for you, translates pretty well as a live song. So, um, you know, depending on what you read, and certainly you observed it, mm-hmm. so I guess every I, concert I, is different. I, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really notice the, uh, the, how they responded to those songs uh, one way or the other. I mean, I, I was just enjoying the show. Uh, somebody told me, um, Nancy Guida, I know Nancy's probably listening, she told me that the local newspaper reviewer gave the show a bad review. I did not see the review and just to you know to put a little thing on this it's the paper i used to work for and i but i don't i don't know this guy i have i did meet him one time but i don't really know him so but for what it's worth uh apparently the one of the local reviewers didn't give it a great review but you know the i know the la times randy lewis gave the la show a very good review yes so, you know, I mean, it's here and there. You know, it depends on who writes it and everything like that. Um, usually, I mean, it it's rare that you see a bad review of a Paul show because everybody's always saying, you know, they uh, basically writing the reviews on the tone of, you know, he, they've given 50 years of, you know, songs in three hours and blah, 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 you know, so. But in any way. It's interesting. I just want to comment on what you said about the site about the pyrotechnics. Mm-hmm. In in every show that I go to McCartney, part of the fun in going is that I'm always surrounded by some people who have never seen him live before. And those people are in shock when Live and Let Die comes on and the fireworks are happening and they're not expecting it. So mm-hmm. for people like us, we're so used to it. So um yeah, but it's it's part of the joy in going to see Paul or Ringo is seeing fans who have never seen them before. So Yeah, the the woman sitting next to me, um, also hadn't seen Paul before and I had to kind of go you better put your fingers in your ears <laughs> and she didn't she was go- she was glad she did so that was kind of interesting all right let's uh now talk about the four new reissues that came out on July the 12th those being Wings Over America Paul is Live uh the Russian album and Amoeba's Gig now, for someone like myself, and I know I brought this up before, this is probably the most interesting Amoeba's gig because it's the first time that uh, the entire concert has been released. Prior to that, it, it only came out as an EP of four songs, and then through Paul's website, you could get, I think it was 12 songs, and now it's the entire concert. So um, if what matters to you is getting material that's never come out before, 
then Amoeba's gig is probably the most important of these four releases. And um, as far as I know, the Wings Over America is not remastered from the last time, which was only a few years ago. I'm not sure about Paul is Live. Maybe one of you guys know if that's been remastered. And um, and then there's the Russian album. So who would like to talk about any or all of these releases? Well, let me uh, just jump in. That I I would I listened to Amoeba's gig a bunch of times, and it is a great great live album. And mm. uh, you could make the argument uh, that it it stands with, you know, I mean, I think everyone will always gravitate to Wings Over America. And I could be wrong, but uh, I'm sure most everyone will gravitate to that as being McCartney's essential live album. This one is not is really not all that far from that. There was a powerful performance. McCartney sounds great. I mean, some of the tunes are, are uh, really uh, aggressive. Even Calico Skies, yeah, uh, mm. you know, has a little bit of punch to it. You could tell the band and McCartney are having a ball playing in a small venue, well, a store. And uh, that was also something that was pretty special. And this is maybe, a, in a way, a kind of a hint at what we're going to talk about later. But uh, around that time that he played at Amoeba, he did a show with the Highline Ballroom in New York City. Yes. Uh, promoting memory almost full. Mm. Another thing about um, about this uh, Amoeba's gig is it reminded me, because I haven't listened to it in a little bit, of really what a terrific album Memory Almost Full is, because there's a bunch of tracks uh, from that that they perform live. The only thing I would, looking at these four reissues, it, it just they seem odd that, that that it was done like this, reissuing Wings Over America again giving us the Russian album as a live album, which it's really not, right? I mean, it's mm. a studio recording. Uh, maybe it was recorded live in the studio, but... Uh, and then you have Paul is Live, which is... It's a live album. I would have liked them to actually put all of the attention on Amoeba's gig and release that individually as a quote-unquote new album. Let it get the uh, front and center attention... I think more people would be paying attention to it, mm. um, you know, and then down the line, maybe do in the McCartney archive collection, a reissue of Paul is live and tripping the live fantastic and unplugged do it that way. I just felt like Amoeba's gig deserves more attention. It's going to get kind of lost in the shuffle amongst these other reissues. And I don't think we needed, uh, I know we didn't need another wings over America. No. But I ordered well, it on colored vinyl anyway, and tell you what else is new. A lot of this is just to keep the music in print. And since mm. this is probably just so it can revert over to Universal as opposed to Concord. Still, so I mean, but if we did it, if, if he did it like if they maybe released Amoeba's gig as a standalone and promoted it as a new album, it technically would be, even though most of the material would come out a couple of times. I think it. I think it was a performance, and it's an album that's worth the attention for it to stand by itself, and then do what really is a sensible, maybe live reissue campaign in getting, you know, the other live albums out there back in the world as well, and you know, mm -hmm. back in the U.S. Both versions maybe, and group Paul is live with that and tripping, and and the Russian album is another one I think that deserves to be allowed to stand by itself, complete all of the tracks that were uh, available for that and, and let that have its moment in the sun by itself. Yeah, I, I mean, here he put out the 11-track the eleven track Russian version, the, the first Russian version. And, yeah. Right, you know, then there was a second Russian version that was 13. I think when it came out mm. on CD, it was 14. So it mm -hmm. just seems a little weird to... Yeah, and it's sort of like negative bonus tracks, you know. <laughs> complete definitive Russian album on its own. That's what should have happened. Well, and, and a and complete definitive unplug too. You know, I, that was yeah. Just going to say that exactly. Well, I'm sure that's further on down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Amoeba's gig. First of all, I was blown away that it was it was 12 years ago. That that performance happened, yeah. and and if you remember, it was shortly afterward that uh, that Paul put I think it was four tracks from that performance online, 
Right. And um, and one of them was his performance of Here Today. And I thought at the time that it it took I thought I was very impressed that he had the guts to put that particular performance out there, knowing what a perfectionist he is, because, mm-hmm. I mean, even on the introduction, he's going down the emotional chute even there. And then, of course, <laughs> you, you know, you hear what happens on the, you know, the actual song itself. And uh, it's uh, like I said, I think it takes it takes a lot of guts to to not say, well, you know, that's not really, uh, you know, my emotions got the best of me. So uh, let's not put that, you know, that track out. Mm-hmm. But uh, so uh, and, and uh, you know what Darren was saying about the uh, uh, the performance itself of the, you know, the entire concert. Yeah. Well, I mean, for one thing, this is before really all of the concerns about uh, about Paul's voice. He's, you know, he's still in in very good voice at that point. And uh, and, uh, you know, the band is uh, is also in really good form and especially playing before, you know, before a smallish audience, uh, you know, in, you know, in a in a record store, which, right. you know, obviously was, you know, as as he says at the very beginning, that it's about what did he say? It's a, you know, the most di- dysfunctional uh, gig we've ever done or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I also like the fact that he does some ad libbing here. Yes. Um, which we're not used to mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. from yeah. him. You know, he'll say something like, uh, they, they do Matchbox in concert, and he mm-hmm. comes out of it saying, written by the great Carl Perkins, who also gave us the classic Blue Suede Shoes. Mm. Um, but he didn't write this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he goes into Get Back. So it's like, yeah. um, I suppose if Paul was doing Matchbox on stage on his tours, he might say the exact same thing. Yeah. But, um, but for this, it's entirely fresh. So, um, yeah. Alan? Um, yeah, I, I thought it was a really good show, too. I bought all four of them. I haven't listened to the other three because, you know, I mean, there's mm. kind of no reason um, at the moment anyway. I mean, and, you know, the Amoeba show, it was it was nice hearing it in full. I did go to the Highline show, which was very similar that Darren mentioned. And, uh, you know, both of these shows and, in fact, several other shows – of his too i mean i really think he's at his best at least for me Mm. in the small shows when it hasn't got the whole light and video show and he's not you know eight miles away from a lot of the people in the place Mm. it's a fairly intimate thing he does Mm. tend to ad lib a bit he doesn't have to have you know wait for the stage to move around or the screens to clear or whatever it is um it just uh you know it's it's special because he does it so rarely he does it a bunch actually but but Mm. not that frequently and uh you know i think i think it can be heard in the amoeba performance um you know i had heard the four tracks he put online and then there was a tra- uh, a, a physical cd that came mm-hmm. out um with more tracks but not the whole 21 that are on this and uh you know so i was really looking forward to hearing it and you know just as a performance i, I thought it was was great it was a lot of fun mm-hmm. yeah I got to say, I I was blown away by this. The the clarity here in the audio is just stunning. And uh, like we've all been saying, he was in fine voice here. When I look at this collection here, I'm reminded of the fact that when he went out on tour after Memory Almost Full, he didn't do House of Wax, which is a great song Mm -hmm. off that album. And his vocals on this, in this performance, are just tremendous. It's really powerful. It's really strong. And then also, uh, that was me. He didn't do on tour. And he sounded great on that, on that song, too. So for my money, just to have those two songs live, which didn't end up on Good Evening New York City, it's worth it just for that. But, um, yeah, all the Beatles stuff sounds great. He's just in wonderful voice. And... Um, the only complaint I have to make is when uh, they did nod your head 
and it's only like uh, a minute and 20 seconds. And he's he's shouting and he's got that great screaming voice and you want it to keep going on. And then it ends abruptly. So uh, there's a short recording of Babyface. You don't mind mm. if it doesn't go on. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, the rest of it is absolutely wonderful. For just a small, intimate gig, it's great that it's captured here. And, um, you know, I think this is one that I'm going to treasure as a live release. Although I like all of his live albums and nothing I think will ever compare to Wings Over America. But this is great as um, a small, intimate show and uh, packs a lot of punch for one CD. And by the way, I heard that the vinyl release of Amoeba's gig actually has a bonus track. And that's um, a song. Yeah, Yeah. which uh, a bonus track on vinyl that you can't get anywhere else. Hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I got the vinyl, but I haven't listened to that yet. It, it, I have to sort of wait until I have time to do a transfer because I'm going to play it only the once. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and also it's coming up, which is, you know, not on my list of top 300 McCartney songs. So, um, but I, I, I will do a transfer of that at some point if someone okay. else doesn't do it first. <laughs> All right. This is great. By the way, did, did Steve okay. um, chime no, in at all? No, I, no, I didn't because I haven't. I haven't heard the uh, the new CD. I okay. I, I do have a bootleg of the of the entire concert, but I mean, uh, I don't have the new CD yet. So, ah. hmm. and you know, from what I remember from when they came out earlier, the audio that I heard was very compressed from Amoeba's gig, and this mm. is so much better. This sounds like just a real natural sound with mm-hmm. very little, if any, compression. And that makes a world of difference, at least to me anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now it's our time to reminisce. As we look back at uh, the fact that this is our 300th show, and I'm sure that each of us have uh, some particular favorites that you might want to talk about that you're most proud of. Could be anything. Could be any particular topic, maybe certain interviews that we've done through the years, whether it be from the beginning when it was just me and Steve, or when uh, Al and Alan joined, and the newer ones with Darren. We keep on evolving here. We're like the Plastic Uncle Band, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, who would like to start? Let's um, let's start with Al. Okay. Uh, well, I have to kind of separate. The, the shows that I particularly liked were always the, you know, the discussion shows. Uh, I think those were the, you know, really the, from a, you know, Sparks point of view, whatever you, however you want to put it, I think those were, were those were the best ones. Things like the, um, the, the, the various debates over the Capitol albums, uh, Pure McCartney. <laughs> uh, oh yes! Oh yeah. yes! Press to play. <laughs> I think and, we need to do a new one on that. <laughs> we'll bring you back for that, Al. Well, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't think my opinion has really changed all that much. Let's wait for the deluxe reissue, the archival press to play, and then yeah. <laughs> we'll do that again. Exactly. But also there was uh, uh, one particular show that we that was kind of a very uh, impromptu one was the memorial that we did for Cynthia Lennon. Hmm. Because if you remember, uh, the news broke uh, on this one particular morning and I forget who it was, maybe Steve who initiated, uh, you know, getting, uh, oh, actually, oh, wait a minute. I think we were, we were supposed to, we were already scheduled to record that particular week's show. And then when the news broke about, about Cynthia, we decided to record a, you know, kind of an impromptu memorial show that I think would run before that particular week's show. Mm. Weren't we, on, weren't we online when when that broke? Did, didn't I happen to? Did I happen to notice that it was, was short? Uh, now we weren't online yet, but uh, I think I think he possibly you or or Ken may have like you know 
contacted us and said, "Did you hear the news about, you know, about Cynthia?" It was very, it was, it was very shortly beforehand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, so that was, you know, that was a, a very special one. But also, some of the, uh, you know, some of the interview shows also. The one that sticks out for me is the Denny Sywell right. yes. show, where basically he almost took command of the interview and just, and then this went on, I think it was almost a two hour interview. Right. And, uh, he, you know, he just rolled with the, with the flow and it was, it was very, very good. And then, and, uh, Lawrence Juber as well was mm-hmm. also very good. And then kind of like the, the sort of what you might call the, the usual suspects, you know, the authors, the, you know, people like Chuck Gunderson and Bruce Spicer and Jude Kessler and also uh, Chip Manninger. And Alan, if I remember correctly, weren't you involved at that point with the Leninology project? No, Chip was involved with the McCartney Legacy Project, which I'm doing oh, with yes. Adrian Sinclair. And then we all sort of parted ways very amicably, I think. Uh-huh. And, uh, but we were, it was going to be part of Chip's series that includes Leninology because that's his own uh, publishing company, so to speak. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and then the other one that kind of stuck out for me was, uh, was actually was Dave Morell. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which was, uh, which I think came, that came through Steve, if I remember correctly, since they're both out there on the on the West Coast, and that, I think that was when um, the first of his smallish books mm-hmm. about his reminiscences came out, and uh, it was uh, it was actually a, it was it, it was a surprisingly entertaining uh, conversation. He's a great storyteller. Yes, you know, and I would love to interview him about everything else besides the Beatles because he's got so many stories to tell. Yeah. Being a promotion man for so many years on different record labels and the stories he could tell, mm-hmm. I'm sure. But uh, yeah, those are some great ones. Any others you want to add? Uh, no, I think those are like the, those are the real kind of highlights for me. Okay, how about you, Steve? Well. I also mentioned the Denny Sywell. That I remember mm-hmm. after after we got off the air, after we had finished taping, we were sitting there talking for like an hour how yeah. good it was. It, it surprised the hell out of us. And Denny, if you're listening, oh, you, you're amazing, dude. Um, but yeah, that was that was great. Another one that uh, blew me over was Elliot Mint. Yes, that mm. was astounding. He was such a great storyteller. He was he talked about anything and everything and he never, you know, he 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 didn't back away from any questions. I there has always been the internet, you know, feeling that he is very he, he's ultra protective, but he he was very I mean, he did not I mean, he's not going to bash Yoko and he's not going to bash John, but he was very open and answered every question that we asked. And I, that was one of my favorite interviews with, and then also Lewison, of course. I mean, that was, that was astounding. It was so, mm-hmm. it was so mm-hmm. good. And I think Alan was the one that got him on. And that was, that was just a, such a great, a great conversation. I mean, there's so many others, uh, Frida Kelly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, t- we talked to her more than once. It, it, as far as discussions go, there's two that stick out. One is uh, the Magical Mystery Tour debate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. Which, I will have, which I will have with you anytime again, Ken. And, uh, and the other was the eight days a week, the touring years, when we went and mm. ripped the, that apart. Yeah. And that was, I, I, we weren't the only ones that ripped that apart, but I think we did a better job of ripping it apart than anybody else did. So... <laughs> That was cool. I mean, I, 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 there's there's just so many, uh, but those I just those are the ones that stick out. So mm, all great, and too many of them are ones that I picked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, me too. All right, how about you, Darren? Well, being that I only have been on the show since September, uh, I've got a, a handful of uh, highlights for me personally. 
I have to mention the interviews that we've done, all of them in, in one way or another. Uh, the interviews that we've done have all, uh, you know, brought some special stuff to the table. Authors Brian Southall we spoke to and, and Ken Mansfield we had on. We had uh, Terry Crane recently. Mm-hmm. And uh, they all uh, were outstanding, as was bassist John Montagna. Uh, yes. Which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And then getting to meet John in person at the Festival Beatles fans. Those were highlights for me. And the fact that the first show that we did, uh, that I did as uh, a co-host, was uh, talking about a new Paul McCartney album, and that being Egypt Station. And um, the fact that, um, you know, I grew up with uh, Wings as the soundtrack to my youth growing up in the 70s, and every McCartney album, probably starting with Venus and Mars, I could put myself, you know, where I was when it came out or when I got my copy, how I got my copy, listening to it where I was sitting in the living room when I was... 10 years old when Venus and Mars was out and the fact that I kick off my uh, time here on this podcast talking about a new McCartney album. So that was, uh, that's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, we covered a lot of ground in the short time that uh, you've been on there. And yeah, well, it was uh, immediate hit the ground running at Egypt station comes out. Then uh, the Imagine films come out. The Imagine box set comes out. Here comes the white album, the white album box set that we did several shows on Lennon more than one on the White Album. I know we did more than one on the Lennon, Lennon releases. So uh, we, we were kept busy for those first couple of months, starting in September. We'll have to wait and see if it's a repeat performance the last uh, four months of this year. Well, my wallet does not want that to happen. <laughs> but uh, for topic-wise, it, uh, it made planning and executing much easier. Well, we got uh, Abbey Road coming, and... Uh... We're pretty certain that uh, there'll be McCartney remasters, too. We don't know if anything is coming out on the lead in front. Or I mean, well, or, we know we also but, have, and, and, and um, I believe it was, uh, uh, I believe it was Brian Southall, I think, was going to keep us posted on the Linda McCartney photo exhibit in mm-hmm. Scotland. Oh, no, that was, that was Ken McNabb. Ken McNabb, I, I apologize, and I mm-hmm. left Ken out, and I'm so sorry. I knew I was forgetting someone. Uh, when I made my list of the authors but uh, that we've interviewed in recent months. But, you know, we got that Linda McCartney thing coming up, the reissue of Wide Prairie. I have a funny feeling. Well, we got Ringo uh, next month coming through uh, the New York City area, at least, the All-Star Band on tour. And right. I have a funny I have a hunch not long after that. I could be wrong. This is completely a hunch that we'll be hearing about Ringo's next album. I, I You know, I just got that feeling later in the year we're going to be starting to hear specifics about it. Mm. Well, he's been averaging a new album like every two years, so right. it's very possible. He has been recording. So, yeah, it'll be a busy end of the year, I think, for us. And, Alan, how about you? Okay, it's, uh, yeah, probably almost everything on my list has been mentioned. Um <laughs> It's funny because we have debated a lot um, back, especially in the days when Al and Steve were in the show about whether we have too many guests or whether the discussions are better. And we went back and forth a lot. Um, Mm. And a lot of the ones that I remember most vividly are the guests. Um, I'm not sure which side of that debate I came down on at the time, but uh, uh, the ones I remember now are the guests and uh you know Elliot Mintz I thought was great uh mm-hmm. a lot of people you know and and sometimes we get you know comments in email or in the YouTube comments or whatever of people who think Elliot is you know just a shill and uh okay you know what fine Elliot is a personal representative he does his job but I think at this point Elliot's isn't he basically retired for the most part yeah, yeah. yeah. you know yeah. and he has been involved with an awful lot of you know really top flight people up there i mean he was dylan's rep too for a long time so if you uh, if you follow him on facebook he's always posting yeah you know who he's been around who he's been around and so you know not all of the people that he posts i i would have linked with him 
Yeah. So he's been linked with a lot of people. And he does it in a very elegant way, too. And, um, mm. you know, I had interviewed him way back when the Lost Lennon tapes came out and, uh, and yeah. you know, and, this, and, and, and a number of times in between when I needed information, I'd call him. And, but, you know, I thought the interview he did with us really was great. Um, and, you know, what can I say? Uh, the same with, uh, well, John Montagna, Darren mentions but you know what i mean he um he had his base with him right i mean he was showing us stuff uh you know, yeah uh which which was helpful because we don't play tracks you know so it, it really was helpful having someone actually sort of demonstrate on their own guitar nothing that we are going to have to deal with the copyright or digital millennium act or whatever about mm. um mm -hmm. but it clarified a lot of things and uh and he was really good ken mansfield as well his memories of that you know january 30th 1969 on the roof and also his other memories of dealing with apple um i thought they were very illuminating and yeah the one one discussion that was also an interview that steve mentioned the eight days a week crew um mm -hmm. <laughs> i thought that was really good i mean i don't think we had intended in any way or pre-discussed the idea that you know we're ambushing them but there were a lot of issues that we had with that film and the one thing i remember apart from being a part during part of that interview i got kicked off because my internet went down and yeah <laughs> so I, <laughs> I remember. and i came back and you know we're talking about you know why did you use colorized stuff and he said, one of the one of the the producers said, uh, "Well, you know, what do you think was colorized?" And I sort of went through a list mm. of something like seven bit, bits of film that were colorized, and he was kind of surprised that anybody would know that. Which tells me these guys don't know who their audience is. You know, um, yeah. I'm not unique in knowing that kind of stuff. An awful lot of the people filing into the theater, you know, anxiously waiting to, you know, this film all knew that. They all knew what was colorized. They all knew what had been faked. They all knew that, you know, even on the Shea Stadium film when it was shown, it was really the, the twist and shout from Hollywood Bowl. And, mm -hmm. and Anne had been put into the Manchester film from 1963, for crying mm -hmm. out loud. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I don't think they felt, you know, they walked away bruised from that interview. I mean, I thought we all thought it, on both sides that it was a good discussion, but I think that they were surprised at how much people who are interested in the Beatles actually know about the Beatles and that you can't just fake it. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope they have taken that with them. And when they do their next Beatles project, it's a little bit better. Um, mm. Let's see what else. Uh, the interviews, I think, during my time on the show, I think we've talked to Lawrence Juber twice, and I think you talked to him before, uh, you and St Ken and Steve. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoy talking to him, um, you know, just as a guitarist. He, uh, you know, he knows an awful lot of stuff besides the wing stuff, but he was very illuminating, I thought, about the the relationships within wings, the making of Back to the Egg, all that stuff. There was one where he got really technical, guitar, uh, uh, mm. guitar technical. Do you remember that? He didn't normally do that, but on this particular one, I yeah. think it was the second one. Yeah, he got very technical, and that was that was great because he he really got into it very heavily. well. And we got into a discussion of the very arcane nineteenth-century guitarist composer Giulio Rigondi, which you don't hear on many <laughs> Beatles shows. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's see the authors, you know, Chuck Gunderson I thought was great. It's it's mm -hmm. it's always fun having Mark Lewis on because, you know, he knows an awful lot of stuff. I mean, do you even need to say that? Uh and uh yeah, and Ken McNabb. Ken McNabb was also a, a lot of fun. Um so yeah, uh but if, if we're were we supposed to keep it to 3? It's almost impossible. To do I know that. it's almost impossible, <laughs> but so from that list, the three that I had singled out were Ken Mansfield, Elliot Mintz, and John Montagna, um, all of which were pretty close. They were numbers two, 
290, 268, and 291. And uh, my rationale, in a way, for that was that we did a show a little bit like this for the 200th show, um, talking about past ones, where I think I chose the Chaz Newby one back then. So mm. I thought I would just focus mostly on the ones in between 200 and 300. Wait, so. nobody told me math was going to be involved in this. I didn't have the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't write down the numbers for my episode. So. I, didn't, I didn't either. Mm. Oh, well. So I'll quickly mention my favorites. Um, combination of interviews and um, discussions on albums and, well, certain topics that I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Interviews, I got to mention Denny Sywell. I, I really was blown away by that interview. Mm-hmm. I think that there's something to be said about someone who, you know, we are talking about almost 50 years ago that he worked with Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. And his memory seemed to be pretty vivid for that time. And and also something to be said about just about any member of Wings is that even though with the fourth and fifth uh, members, the bands lasted three to four years, within that short period of time, Paul was so prolific, there's so much you can talk about in that very short period of time. We could have done one show just on Ram <laughs> with Denny Sywell. We could have done one show on Wildlife. We could have done one show on Red Rose Speedway. We could have done one show on the tours with Wings. But his, his memory was just really sharp, and he's just a great speaker. And uh, I'd love to have him back on the show. And um, I interviewed him recently for the, the Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway box sets, and he was a great interview. Always is. Um, I recommend to all our listeners to listen back, if they haven't heard that interview, to check it out. Mark Lewison, what can you say about Mark? He's always a great interview. It's impossible for him not to be. He's always got fascinating things to say and things that you never knew about before. So Mark Lewison on his worst day is a, is a fascinating interview. He really is. I mean, I watch on YouTube some interviews with Mark, and every single time I learn something new that I never, I never knew before. And there's something to be said about that. Um, Elliot Mintz, I agree with all you guys, was fantastic. Um, and he couldn't have been nicer. You know, he was just very candid. Whatever he felt like saying about John and Yoko, yes, very protective. But everything he said was from the heart and, I believe, truthful and just exactly how he felt. And you really, you never felt uncomfortable bringing up any topic with him. And um, John Montagna as well. And the thing about John is that particular interview, he was able to talk about Paul's bass playing in such a way that, you know, in, in layman's terms, so you don't have to be technical to understand or, or really understand bass playing or notation or anything in such a way that he... he explained why Paul was such an innovator on the bass during the Beatle years, and he did it so well. And like you said, Alan, he did play a lot of Paul's bass lines to illustrate that. He was fantastic. We got a great response from that. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Juber was great. I just interviewed Lawrence for his new CD, and he's always got something fascinating to talk about. But the thing about Lawrence, you know, I've interviewed him several times now, and it's so easy just to fall back and talk about his time with Wings, but he's so knowledgeable about so many different genres of music, and he can talk about that, and also relate it in some way to with Paul and with the Beatles. He's always a great interview. Chuck Gunderson, and going back to my time with just Steve, Chuck Gunderson, Jim Birkenstadt, there was this one period where it was like one author after another. There was these slew of books that came out all at once, and we were just banging out all these interviews, all, you know, for, it seemed like a couple of months there, Steve. And it's just one author after another, and they were all really great. And recently, Ken McNabb and Terry Crane. Um, I love the interview shows. There's nothing like having a strong interview. Anytime you learn just one thing that you never learned before, at least to me, it's, it's, it makes it so worth it. The other shows that we've done that were not interviews, we did a show, Did the Beatles Ever Make Any Mistakes? So that might be the one you were talking about, Steve, when you brought up Magical Mystery Tour. So that might have been the one, but no, 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 no. Yeah, that was that wasn't it. When the uh, the remastered DVD uh, came out, oh, okay. you and I yeah. discussed the worth of Magical Mystery Tour. We debated okay. it very heavily, and I that's one I will not forget. And that was I, before I came on board. And yep. I remember listening and thinking that if they were, you know, knowing that you were 
on separate coasts, but thinking, <laughs> thinking to myself, if these two were in the same room, mm-hmm. a fist fight was going to break <laughs> out. Uh, I don't think that would ever happen. Yeah, I don't but, think that um, would But I was memorable. I do remember that. Okay, but the the whole, uh, in general, did the Beatles as a band ever make any mistakes? I, I remember that, that was just a great topic. I know? remember that. That was based on a book, as I recall. I think, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember that. I, th- I, 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 I think it was. It, it was based on a book about business decisions, I think. No, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. I think we did that, too. I think we did, bo- we, we did both, but okay. I just thought it would be interesting from our own perspectives. You know, were the Beatles as perfect as sometimes we make them out to be? Was every move the right move that they made? So I thought it would be great for all of us to just add our own opinions on that. Okay. I think that was just a really good topic to begin with. We did a really good show covering with the Beatles. I just was very pleased after we did that show. We just said everything we could possibly say about that album. And it was great that we actually, you know, we had a lot of substance in that show for a very early album of the Beatles. I really enjoyed that one. And I also liked when we did two shows on Flowers in the Dirt. And in particular, there's one thing that we talked about which really stood out for me, which I thought was really interesting, was discussing Paul and Elvis Costello and their relationship and whether or not, and this is like getting into a psychological profile of Paul McCartney, which could be dangerous, (laughs) but um, whether or not Paul is uncomfortable with the idea that anybody that he works with could be measured up to John Lennon. And we were talking about that, and I thought that was a pretty serious subject right there. I wasn't expecting us to bring that up, but it's kind of interesting because a lot of people love the collaboration between Paul and Elvis, and then you got to wonder why they didn't continue. And the critics really liked their working together, and they compared him a lot to John because Elvis would be someone who apparently could tell Paul if he's not putting out his best material or whether or not he could work he should work on his songs, you know, harder. And he'd be one of those people who would do that. And critics really liked that particular collaboration. So it's kind of strange that after that short period of time, that Paul never worked with Elvis writing again. So we got into that as a conversation, which I found fascinating. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, if you, you know, if you, uh, if you read the, um, you know, the, the book that came with the, uh, the box. And also, if you've read Elvis's book, uh, you can kind of see why they didn't work together again. Um, the one particular incident about uh, uh, Paul mentioning something about wanting one of the tracks to sound like uh, one of the oh. Human League yeah, uh, tracks. Yeah. And, and Elvis had to, like, leave the room <laughs> because <laughs> he was he was so upset about it. <laughs> no, I remember that uh, you're talking about that day is done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He Paul was thinking about giving it that approach. Yeah. So, yeah, but I, I would hope that one incident like that is not what led to them not working together after that. But well, I think, you know, that again, in Elvis's book, it, he, you know, he doesn't come right out and say it, but I think he kind of intimates that uh, that actually if they had you know, gotten farther into working together, it might have actually damaged their their personal relationship. Hmm. So it probably is a good thing. Okay. Because All obviously right. they've retained their friendship, uh, you know, over the years. Okay. I haven't read the book, but um, you're certainly it's, giving oh, me reason to, to read it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. So now that we've discussed our favorite shows... We're going to talk about how the Beatles, how certain uh, moments in the Beatles history group and solo affected us to the point where we're going to list our three favorite, uh, most important Beatle moments in our own lives. And like I said earlier, this could be anything. This could be uh, a song coming out, an album coming out, an event, a concert, a TV appearance, anything at all, an interview, it doesn't matter. So why don't we start with Steve? <laughs> okay. I, I, obviously, Ed Sullivan has to be the first mention because, I mean, I, you know, I'll never forget lying on the uh, living room floor uh, and watching it on television. Um, you know, everything sprang from everything sprang from that. I mean, I've 
you know, I've told how I, how I got got to that point and stuff. But I mean, obviously, being at that, watching that moment and, and remembering that moment is, you know, is something I can, I cannot forget. The other two are kind of personal. Um, going to the White Album listening uh, session last year in Studio 2 at uh, Capitol Records and hearing the advanced mixes on their sound system with Giles Martin in the room was just absolutely amazing. I mean, I, you know, I sat there and listened to it and there was nothing, nothing could describe how wonderful it was to be in that room and listen to those mixes on that system. It was funny, and if you've seen my Facebook page, you you see it. There's a picture right outside the room of Paul standing next to a picture of Frank Sinatra. And that picture is actually right across the hall from uh, the, the actual picture of Sinatra. And I had my wife take a picture of me standing next to the picture of Sinatra in the same spot that Paul stood in. And I have that on my Facebook page. And I, I love that because I'm, a, I'm also a big Sinatra fan. And being in that, in that building, in a building that they've both been in is like, is beautiful, you know, it's wonderful. And the other thing, again, it's another, you know, personal thing about being in the uh, Capitol Tower when they, when I was doing a story on, um, on the, uh, anniversary of Capitol Records, and I think I told this story here um, before. We were walking around the hall, and they took us down a flight of stairs, and they opened a door, and there in this room were tapes, nothing but reel-to-reel tapes. And right within my view, and 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 I, I mean, I wear glasses, and my my eyesight is not as good as it, it was when I was younger. But right within my view, that I could not miss. And this was before the album came out. It was uh, the Beatles live at the Hollywood Bowl, and this was before the album came out. And they were not the original. My understanding is the, they're not the original masters. They're the, you know, the secondary tapes. But still, to see not only that album there on a reel to reel, but there were other Beatles albums. There were tapes labeled King, and Nat King Cole. There were Frank Sinatra. And I was take, sitting there. I had my camera, and I was taking pictures. And they were allowing me to take pictures. And I was just... All I was doing was snapping photos and keeping you know, quiet. My wife said to me later, you turned absolutely white <laughs> being in that room. And that was, that was really kind of amazing. So... Mm. And there's just one more, one, one more I have to add. And it also... Uh, involves the Capitol Tower at the Paul McCartney Walk of Fame ceremony. There was a moment where we're all standing there, and, and I'm again taking photos. And a fan had brought a replica uh, bass guitar for Paul to see. And Paul is walking around, and he, you know, how he how he interacts, and he always loves to wave to people. And the kid shows holds up the bass guitar, and Paul is like right in front of me. And Paul goes with his arm, send it over, send it over. And so, and he actually did. He actually handed the thing over the fence and there were you know several rows of people between him and Paul. And it, the guitar made it to Paul. Paul autographed it and sent it back to the kid. And the kid is standing there after the, after the kid, after Paul signed it, waving the guitar to, to say, you know, look, folks, he signed it. And it was a, a, a moment I, you know, that I can't forget that. That was an amazing moment. And I was right there when it happened. So. Wow. So those kind of moments that that kid's going to remember forever. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's great to have one of those. Yep. Okay. So uh, how about you, Alan? Okay. Um you know, it's it's kind of an impossible thing to to identify three things, three events that uh, were particularly important. If you can go all the way back to the Ed Sullivan Show show, so I'm skipping all of the childhood stuff because all of that was 
earth shaking for me from Sullivan on. And I'll just sort of um, talk about some things that just I was personally involved in, because also that way I know I won't be sort of taking someone else's thing from their list. (laughs) One is uh, interviewing um, Paul and Ringo a number of times. And the first time I interviewed each of them, uh, you know, that was really kind of special because you're, you know, (laughs) these are two of the Beatles you're about to talk to, you know, and uh, you think you're not going to be nervous because you know an awful lot of stuff and you know that, you know, you know, a lot of Paul's stock answers and how you're going to get around questions that will allow him to make the stock answers. And, um, you know, I thought uh, the first interview that we did in October 1990, um, I thought was really exceptional just because he wasn't asked the same things. He didn't get a chance to say that he dreamed yesterday. Um, but instead he talked about things like, you know, I, I asked him for instance about, um, you know, the Beatles used to have this policy of having singles not be album tracks. And now he's not only taking the singles off the albums, but also making, you know, five different editions, all with B-sides that can't be gotten otherwise, and putting those out mostly in Japan. So if you're an American collector, it becomes extremely expensive to keep Mm. up with him. And, you know, and he was very straightforward about it. And he said, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, when there was, when we were the Beatles and a promo guy came to us and said, we think this would be a great thing for you to do, and we didn't like it, we could say, you know, and he used an epithet, which I don't think we say on the show. I don't know. Um, and he said, but, the, you know, there were four of us and we could say that and we were the Beatles. And, you know, I'm not the Beatles. I have to think very carefully when someone comes to me with an idea. And I thought, wow, I've, I've never heard him admit that he's not the Beatles. But, you know, I mean, it's not that he claims that he was the Beatles in in, in their entirety. It's just that this was kind of it. it, it he just seemed a little more off the cuff and a little more down to earth um, about this kind of thing. And, and he was great also about, I asked him for instance, when, you know, what do you feel about the, uh, the idea that, you know, now Mark Lewison has studied all your tapes and has cataloged all your live performances. I mean, this was in 1990. So it was like maybe, not long after recording sessions came out. And Mm -hmm. he said, basically, look, this is why we did it. I mean, you can be sour about it and say, "Uh, well, you know, we don't like it now that it's happened, which I took as a reference to um, George, actually. And in fact, I took it as a reference to George because after the interview, he was talking about what he called George's sour period. Um, and but, mm. but he said, you know, we did it for this. We did it to become famous. We did it so that everybody would, you know, want to know all, all about us and all of our stuff and listen to everything. And he, the way he ended that quote, which is what I ended my piece with for the, the New York Times when, uh, when I wrote it up was he said, you know, when you're as good as the Beatles were, or maybe even said when you're as great as the Beatles were, and you did things that were as interesting as the Beatles did, you have to expect for that kind of scrutiny, you know, and it was, uh, you know, it was a really good quote. It's it's better than I've just done. Uh, You can look up the story at nytimes.com, except that the story as they printed it, was a little bit bolderized because the editor of the arts and leisure section at that time read it and said, well, it's a little self-serving of him to say when you're as great as the Beatles are and all that. And I'm sitting there saying, it's the Beatles. Nobody nobody will argue with this. He's, well, you know, you have to tone it down. You have to cut some of that stuff out. And I But thought, the, com- the complete interview, though, uh, did appear in Beatles shortly thereafter in Beatles fan. That's right. That's right. That was another um, cool thing that you know because of um, 
I had a long relationship with Bill going back to not the very early days of Beatles fan, but uh, you know, early, late 80s. early, early, early enough. <laughs> yeah, I guess mid eighties actually. I mean, I think I did yeah. the first CD review that they ran. So yes. Um, yeah, so that would make it even early 80s. Wow, oh, time flies. And yep. so what I would do is that whenever I did any Beatles-related interviews for the Times, um, I would send Bill the complete QA. So mm -hmm. um, those things, you know, if you get a hold of Beatle fan back issues or if you happen to have them, I mean, all that stuff is in there. Ringo interviews, Paul. Um, yep. And so another another sort of, you know, signal event that I wanted to mention was the anthology interviews. Um, I was covering the anthology for the Times as well um, as an advance piece, not as a review. And so that led to a series of interviews that was just like, you know, being in paradise. I mean, I got to say, um, I interviewed Paul in New York about it. I interviewed Ringo in New York about it because they were coming through. And then I flew to London. Derek Taylor was like my minder for those, you know, maybe four days or so that I was there. So we would go to lunch. We would hang out in a boardroom and just talk about stuff or I'd hang out in his office. He had a wall full of bootleg videos behind him. <laughs> um, yeah, he had it all. You know, they, they're aware of what's out there. And uh, he uh, he arranged my schedule of interviewing people. I said, okay, now you're gonna you can go here and do this and that. And otherwise, I was just hanging around. I got to see the TV edits or the British TV edits. Actually, they were preliminary edits because I had some comments about one of them, and ended up talking to Bob Smeaton by phone a bit later because I thought mm. that the way they had done the transition from Rubber Soul to Revolver wasn't clear. I mean. They're talking about Rubber Soul, and then suddenly they're saying, and then we needed to write a song for Ringo and they're on to Yellow Submarine. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that there really needed to be a, a, you know, more of a distinction there. And he called and we talked about it. I'm not sure exactly what they did, but I, I think I think the distinction was clearer. So Derek is like my babysitter in a way, you know, and that was a lot of fun because, you know, we're just we're talking about all kinds of stuff. I interviewed Neil Aspinall, Chips Chipperfield, George Martin, Jeff Emmerich, Bob Smeaton, Jeff Wanfer. And then, you know, in between it all, I had dinner with Mark Lewison. And he so he told me a lot of other background stuff because he was involved in that production. I mean, he was the one who. George Martin went to with the acetate of Love Me Do uh, that he'd found in his cupboard that had Pete Best on it and, uh, mm. you know, and the Please Please Me and uh, said, you know, what do you think this is? And, and Mark actually identified it, you know, through process of elimination. It wasn't labeled properly. It was just an acetate that George found in his house. So Mark gave me a lot of background, too. And... Uh, you know, that was, you know, for the, the maybe twelve to 1,500 words that I got from the Times, um, I was able to cover the story okay, uh, you know, in a very compressed way. But I had all those interviews, which are also all in Beatle fan. Um, yep. Wow. I, I'm, I'm sort of lumping that all together as the second thing after the first interview with Paul. And then I guess the third, I mean, I've, I've seen them in various i never saw the beatles all together never saw john perform live did see bangladesh saw you know maybe i don't know how many paul mccartney shows in every kind of way and a lot of all-star band shows but i want to single out one paul mccartney show which was the i think it was vh1 up close it wasn't mtv right it's it hard to remember which was which um I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. So the up close shows uh, at the Ed Sullivan Theater, you know, there mm -hmm. again, like the Amoeba show was an intimate show, you know, no fancy staging, no screens, no, you know, all the, the uh, rigmarole of a big stadium concert. It was just him on that stage. And let's face it. It was that stage, you know, uh, the right. Ed Sullivan Theater. And, uh, 
you know, I, I, I thought it was a great set. I thought it was, you know, I think it was the first time I'd heard him play, you know, Penny Lane and Fixing a Hole, stuff like that. I mean, I think he was he was revamping his set. And uh, I, I just had a great time. I was like in the first row of the balcony. And was that the um, the day before the Nor'easter or the the day of the Nor'easter? Because Bill was supposed to be there. Yeah. And he couldn't couldn't make connections from Atlanta. I seem to remember it being pretty wet. Um, yeah, uh, that was. But that yeah. was probably it. And I, I think, was actually I was at both those shows. Yeah, I only went to the first. I think. Mm. Okay. So, yeah. So uh, I guess that's my allotment. <laughs> Not bad, right? Yeah, I, I think anybody w- would be more than happy to have your number two or your number three be their mm-hmm. number one, <laughs> or, or even your number one. But uh, it's funny that you and I were in the same room there for the for those Ed Sullivan shows for Off the Ground, the up close shows, and yeah. we didn't know each other then. Right. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, those were some shows too. They really were. You know, and, and and I should say one other thing about the my number one, the one the the, inter, the first interview with Paul. This guy is the most professional interviewee I have ever ever run into, and I've mm. I've interviewed hundreds of people over the years. I mean, I wrote for the Times for nearly forty years, and there's a lot of interviewing in that forty years of people of all kinds. I mean, all musicians. And But Paul had this ability. He knows that you're going to be nervous. He just knows that's the case. And you walk into the room, and he instantly makes you feel like the two of you are old pals. And he's got nothing better to do than talk to you about whatever's on your mind that you want to know about him. You know, I don't know if it's like that now because um, quite often his publicists want to limit interviews to like 20 minutes, which to Mm. me is an announcement, not an interview. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But uh, back in those days, I mean, this was a bit over an hour, you know, you're sort of conscious that you can't be wasting his time, but um you know, I mean, he just, you just feel completely at ease instantly, you know, and uh, it was just an incredible moment. And uh, also, I did probably the most unprofessional thing I've ever done, in, you know, uh, which is that like all these people I've interviewed, you know, Segovia, you name it, and I, I was a guitarist, you know, didn't ask Segovia for an autograph, but I could not be in a room with Paul and not ask him to sign something. So I brought the original 11 track version of the Russian album, which again was not that old at the time. And he signed it and he wrote to Alan, you little expert, you now (laughs) knowing the degree to which the Beatles hate experts, uh, (laughs) Beatles experts. um, I felt a little weird about it, but on the other hand, you know what? I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) So. Yeah, was heard, it was it you that uh, that he uh, he said something uh, to the effect of you know you know you know more about this than uh, than I do? Yeah, he might have. But you know, George more. George used to say that about people. Like he said it. George said it about Jeffrey Giuliano. Yes. And um, we know what George meant, and so yeah. you know, and we know what Giuliano did with that comment too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Hard. so when you hear any of them say something like that, you kind of think it's like a double edged sword because they just don't, you know don't like experts on the other hand paul told me in the interview that he loves being being scrutinized so there you go you know what can you do i thought olivia harrison said that george never said that to jeffrey giuliano well that's possible too yeah (laughs) that is very possible huh yeah all right at some point, I think we should just do a show with you, Alan, and talk about these interviews with Paul and Rico. That's, <laughs> that's, a for, show, that's for sure. That's a show to itself. It really yeah. is. Oh, I, I, I should also mention that during the anthology set of interviews, while George didn't want to be interviewed for reasons I've never figured out, I did actually get to meet him because I went to a meeting where they were storyboarding the Free as a Bird video. And George was at that. And uh, so at least I got to meet him and didn't get to interview him, which is a pity, but there you are. Wow. 
Okay. Al, on to you. Okay. Uh, my three moments actually are, are uh, things that I actually, we, the, I've talked about here and that I've also written about in Beatle Fan, so I'll be mercifully brief. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is actually the uh, the night that I became a Beatle fan, which was not February 9th, 1964. It was the following week. It was, it was the uh, the second Sullivan show. I had I had resisted uh, all of this this hype and these girls going crazy for a group they hadn't heard of a month before and all this. And I pretty much took the the attitude of okay, Beatles. Show me how good you are. And the first Sullivan show didn't quite do it. But the second show did. And I realized years later why. Uh, it was because they were, they were playing uh, not in the confines of a TV studio, but in, in a hotel ballroom on a small stage where they were very close together. And they were only a few <clears throat> months removed from playing those types of shows in ballrooms in England. And so they were very much in their, in their element. And the, the sound mix, for what it was, seemed to be particularly um, uh, favoring Paul's bass and Ringo's drums. And, I mean, that's the, you know, part of the, you know, the secret sauce of what made the Beatles so great was that rhythm section. And so that finally got to me. But also, and may have, may have been that moment was when they, uh, when John, Paul, and George gathered around the, the the microphone and did this boy. And as a fourteen year old, I thought that was just incredibly cool. Mm. And uh, that was pretty much what uh, what made me what made me a fan. Uh, the second one is actually now i never i uh, like alan i never saw the beatles um, in concert as a group in fact i don't know i don't know of any males i've never talked to any males who actually did see beatles concerts they're obviously they were there because you can see it in the footage but i've never right. talked to one so my first exposure to beatlemania in a sense was seeing uh, was seeing a hard day's night for the first time, and that was on a uh, on a hot August afternoon in in 1964 at the the now long demolished Fox Theater in Hackensack, New Jersey, and on a very long line wind to, which took a couple of hours to wind into the theater. Uh, we ended up uh, sitting in the uh, in the balcony, and by the time we got in there, the first movie, which was of a double feature, for those of you who remember double features, uh, which was a mediocre Elvis film called Girls, 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 uh, was ju was just about to end to a chorus of boos. And then, fortunately, there were uh, there were there were no featurettes or anything in between, and there was that you know sort of a flash and the well the, the United Artists logo if you remember, and then then fl that flash, and then you see the Beatles running up the uh, the street uh, to a hard day's night, and I've never heard and and. And in fact, all of that wonderful dialogue from, you know, what I think most people consider the, you know, the, the finest of, of the Beatles films, uh, I never heard any of it because it was an hour and a half of pretty much nothing but screams, especially when, uh, when Paul McCartney would come on the screen. <laughs> You know, it was uh, uh, it was no question about that. But it was uh, I've never heard such the only the only time I've heard anything approaching that kind of noise in a movie theater was the premiere of Return of the Jedi in May of 1983, which got this massive standing ovation at the end of the film. But uh, that was, as I said, that, uh, not having gone to a Beatles concert, that was. That was my uh, pretty much my my first encounter live with uh, with Beatlemania, and the third one is uh, 
fact, we talked about this just before I uh, just before my departure from the show, and that was uh, my uh, my first listen, at least to the first listen to the record, actually, of uh, of Sergeant Pepper. Uh, that I remember pretty, you know, I mean, I don't remember specifically where I was and what I was doing when I purchased each Beatles album, but I certainly do with Sgt. Pepper. And that was, um, you know, in, again, on that same, on that same street, Main Street in Hackensack, uh, at a long, uh, shuttered record store called the Relic Rack and, uh, picked up my copy and basically, you know, got home as quickly as I could and put it on. And it was, uh, even without, you know, you know, didn't have a, I had a pretty much just a, you know, crappy mono fold out <laughs> record player. It would be another year or so before I got my first stereo. And, but just, just hearing it for the first time in mono on that crappy little record player, it was, um, it was just amazing. And listening to it and realizing uh, and this is something that I wrote about in in Bruce Spicer's uh, Sergeant Pepper book. That at the you know the same time that I was listening to that on that uh, that Saturday afternoon, uh, there were millions of of fans all over the world that were having the uh, that were having the same experience. So it was kind of like a and this was you know obviously long before the. Uh, the age of uh, of social media, thank goodness. Uh, and uh, but even without all that, you know, you could it was it was the it was a commute a very much a communal experience. And um, so that you know, those are my three moments. And I will give an honorable mention to May twenty first, nineteen seventy six, at the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Uh, I never, as I said, never saw the Beatles live, never saw, didn't see uh, the concert for Bangladesh or One to One or any of the shows on the Dark Horse tour. So this was my first time seeing a Beatle on stage and uh, it was the Wings Over America uh, show. And uh, it's, um, uh, that's another one that will be, you know, burned into my memory for, uh, for, for good. So those are my... Those are my moments. Well, that's really powerful stuff, Al. Thank you. I Thank mean, you. these are th- these are things that that we all carry with us that stick out in our memories. You know, some things stick out more than others. Absolutely, they're all just so powerful. And you realize as you get older, you can get very emotional even oh, thinking yeah. about some of these things. In fact, I remember you saying on the show that when you saw Wings and Paul did yesterday, you were oh, yeah. you, you were crying. <laughs> it took me. It took me all through. You gave me the answer to kind of get myself back together. Wow, that's that's really something. All right, so we'll get to my top three Beatle moments, and I have to say, for what ranks in third place, it's really a tie. It's really tough to decide between these two, but I have to say, seeing Paul at the Mean Fiddler um, was really something. Um, <laughs> That was a a show that I did not expect to see. I went to England with a friend of mine. We were going to take a a vacation, uh, a week's long vacation. And from the moment that we landed, we heard about Paul about to do the show at the Mean Fiddler, kind of in preparation for uh, Unplugged on MTV. And um, whatever plans we had made for the, for the vacation, this, this took top priority. And, uh, I actually got uh, a ticket from a scalper on the street and we got to go into the show and there was nothing quite, as Alan has said, seeing someone like Paul in, in a small venue like this and it was packed. And, and I kind of liken this to, you know, what, what Beatle fans went, went to see at the cavern because you really, you couldn't breathe. You couldn't even move. I was standing in the same spot for a couple of hours. I really couldn't move my feet. And um, I couldn't have been any more than maybe 15 to 20 feet in front of Paul. And he did two sets during the show. He did an acoustic set and an electric set. And I always remember somebody in the crowd was yelling out, cafe on the left bank. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, And Paul gave this look like, why would anybody request that? 
And I was like, yeah, play Capai on the left bank. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was a tremendous show. And uh, what could be better? Like uh, what you were saying, Alan, the up-close shows. And you got to see Paul at the, at the, uh, at the Cavern, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Mean Fiddler is definitely one of them. And then there's the first time that I interviewed Ringo, who I've had the, the privilege of interviewing three times. And there's nothing quite like meeting one of them for the first time. And uh, this was at Waterloo Village in New Jersey, and it was on August the 28th, 1992. And it was uh, in the middle of one of the all-star band concerts. Because back in those days, and for many of the tours, in the middle of the show, individual members got to do their solo spots. So you might have one or two members doing a song by himself or with one other member. And while that was going on, I talked to Ringo backstage for an interview that lasted only about five minutes. But it was mainly to talk about his songwriting. And I think he was kind of surprised that I brought that up. And I brought it up really in all the interviews. I've, I've interviewed him three times now. And uh, talking about writing with Vinnie Poncia. And, um, you know, that's a moment that I'll always take from me. And I, actually, when I was backstage, I didn't know when Ringo was approaching me. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said to me, is this Ken Michaels, the legend? <laughs> and... <laughs> I don't know how I did this. You would have thought I would have froze, but I just came right back and said, well, I'll never be as big a legend as you, Ringo. And how did I ever <laughs> just come right back and say that? You know, when I think about that now, it's like, what? Did I really say that to him? <laughs> it's pretty amazing. But uh, yeah, I'll always remember that moment, uh, the first of three interviewing Ringo. My second favorite Beatle moment is the Wings Over America concert which I did see in Madison Square Garden. I loved seeing that show because at that time, following all the solo Beatles activities and all their success and knowing how well Wings albums were doing and listening to the radio and especially rock radio at the time in New York City and hearing not just Paul songs, but Denny Lane's Time to Hide being played on the radio and Medicine Jar from Jimmy McCulloch. And it wasn't just Paul songs. You even heard on WPLJ be now defunct, unfortunately, WPLJ, they would even play uh, Cook of the House on the radio. And uh, and Why No Junko from Wings to the Speed of Sound. So I was going there, obviously, to see Paul, but I was going there to see Wings. And it meant a lot to me to see a Wings concert and to hear all these songs that Paul was doing, primarily from his solo career. And yes, it was great to hear the Beatles songs too, but to see him at the top of his game. And he was in such fine voice. And this band really rocked. And I loved seeing them as a band. You know, I wasn't just going to see Paul. I was going there to see Paul and this band. And um, I always bring up the fact that he closed the show with Soily, which at the time I never heard before because he hadn't released it, although I've been told it had already been bootlegged. But um, when the show ended, everybody turned to each other and was questioning what was that song. And it was very unusual to end the concert with a song that he, you haven't released before. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that was, I, I call that the greatest concert of my lifetime. And I've seen Paul so many times now. I feel really blessed that I've seen him a lot in concert. And there's no doubt about it. All the tours that followed have been wonderful, but there'll never be anything like the first time that you see him. And mm-hmm. certainly at that time in his career when he could do no wrong and Wings at the Speed of Sound was at the top of the charts, Silly Love Songs was number one in the country. And, uh, you know, even at that same time, rock and roll music had been released and got to get you into my life was a hit. And it was just a glorious time to be a Beatle fan and to see the success that Paul was having at the time. So number two is definitely seeing Wings Over America at Madison Square Garden. And my number one Beatle moment is actually seeing Help in the movie theater. And um, I saw Help before I saw Hard Day's Night. I didn't see a Hard Day's Night in the movie theater when it first came out. Help was the first Beatle movie I ever got to see. And I was just mesmerized by the group. I loved the cinematography in that film. There's never been anything like it. I always say there's nothing like those three minutes of Ticket to Ride with the Beatles skiing on the Swiss Alps. There's so much that I love about that film. That particular moment of Ticket to Ride where they're hovering over the piano and you got the notes above them 
And uh, all the different locations they went to, their apartment that they shared, how cool that was. And um, in the Bahamas, you know, all the great scenes, Ringo being stuck in, in the um, uh, in the basement of that of that bar or that cellar with the with the tiger about to threaten him, you know, and then a stadium rises and sings Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in D minor, you know. That was such a magical moment there, and I was just glued to the screen. And also, I know this will sound strange to a lot of our younger listeners, but having grown up with a black and white TV set up until that point, to see the Beatles in color was a big deal. And um, I was just transfixed onto the screen. And um, I always remember I was in the movie theater, and when the movie ended, I stayed in the theater because I wanted to watch it again. And all of a sudden, in the darkness, there was this light shining up, shining on me. It was this usher with my mother standing in the aisle, ready to take me out of the theater. <laughs> so um, that was a great moment for me, seeing help in the movie theater. That was it for me. And uh, I'm not going to say that made me the big Beatle fan that I am. But um, certainly 1964... With the onslaught of all that music coming at you, hearing I Want to Hold Your Hand first and all the Beatle music on the radio, nonstop. I mean, that was something in and of itself. But visually, seeing the Beatles on screen for help, there was nothing like it. Yeah. And that's, a, that's one of my strongest memories <laughs> ever yeah. as being a Beatle fan. So, um, yeah, that would be it for me. Okay. Darren? Yeah. Hello! Yeah. Oh, hey, Darren. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that after I, um, after I heard Alan, Alan's thing, I officially resigned my position at WFUV and <laughs> sold everything I own <laughs> because it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, that was pretty remarkable, Alan. That's my why I, did, I didn't want you to follow Alan. See that? What was that? I, did, I didn't want you to follow Alan. I did know it was good because it gave me a chance to write my resignation. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's hard for me to narrow anything down to three when asked. I usually m manage to come up with ten things, and I combine them into ties and stuff, and say, "Here's my three featuring ten items." But <laughs> I, I have this down to three uh, things that are very important to me. And uh, first off, the opportunity that I had to go to England twice with my wife. My honeymoon in December 1994 was to uh, it was two weeks in England, which uh, included a stop in Wales in between London and Liverpool, because my wife lived in Wales at one point. But the London portion, going to outside, being outside the Abbey Road studio, it was like you know this this is the moment. This is the, at this this point, this place, this piece of land was where creation took place for me and then doing the crosswalk walking the crosswalk and yes in december of 1994 it was uh, chilly and a little damp i did one lap across the crosswalk barefoot um <laughs> wasn't okay. the best decision in my life but i did it i don't know how paul did it in august because it had to be hot and there's rocks in the road as i found out Getting also to uh, wander outside the Apple building and then at the end of our, our honeymoon or vacation, several days in Liverpool, uh, needless to say, was magical. But I had no idea that it was going to be one up uh, in, I think, 2000, 2008. Uh, my wife just corrected me in the background. I was going to say seven. 2008, we went back to England and this time I was able to arrange a personal tour of the Abbey Road Studios. And not only me, <laughs> but the whole family, my wife, my mother, and the kids. We were all in England. I said, hey, I'm going to have the whole family with me. No problem. I say, what? No problem? Are you serious? And uh, we got a personal tour of Abbey Road Studios. Now, specifically, we were brought in, but I guess this is the main place to go, we were brought in Studios 2 and the control room and 3. And that was it. But that was enough. Um, so I only kind of saw the, you know, of obviously the vestibule, the lobby uh, 
uh, area and down the hall. And when you walk in Studio 2, I'm telling you, the chills are off the charts that you get. And it looks exactly like all of the pictures that you had seen for the decades before that. Um, it looks exactly the same. And the piano, probably not the piano, but one of the pianos is right there in the middle of the floor. You know, And it looks like it's been sitting there since the mid 60s because the you know the uh the furniture is all nicked up and chipped up and you know how many dozens maybe hundreds of times the Beatles sat at this piano and there's my son who at the time was seven and my daughter who was um maybe uh nine plunking away at this piano while the, I, I don't know who she was, but the you know the person who worked at Abbey Road that was taking us around on the tour was basically talking to me and my mother and all the facts and whatnot. And I was asking the questions. My wife was given the job to take the pictures, take ten pictures of every corner and everything you see. I don't even think I'll be able to figure out how to use the camera while we're being brought around. And I did the staircase up to Studio Two to the, not the studio to the control room. Uh, which is very small and is actually very oddly placed because you can't see where the band is down on, uh, you know, in the studio floor unless you kind of like, if I remember correctly, you kind of have to crane your neck a little bit or stand up at the window to see who's down there on the studio floor. And Studio 3, which is, uh, if, if memory serves correct, where the uh, old Need is Love session took place for the television broadcast, and uh, John Williams did all of his like movie scores in Studio Three, and then of course after that the crosswalk again with my family and going back to the Apple Building. But being in uh, Abbey Road is uh, pretty much I think head and shoulders ahead of everything else. And there are pictures I have to get them on my Facebook radio page. They do exist somewhere on the internet. I got to organize them of of us walking around and. You'll enjoy the dopey. For those of you who know Patrick from SpongeBob SquarePants with the drool coming out of the corner of his mouth, every shot has me with that look on my face of, of disbelief that I'm actually in this room. And then, uh, you know, I kind of a, a little bit of a second uh, to that was getting to go into the bedroom where John and Yoko's bed in took place in Montreal, which I actually have been in twice now. Both times I've stayed in the hotel, I con the uh, front desk to uh, allow me and my wife to go check out the suite. Uh, and I recently realized that they've just renovated that suite. So it is, I think, totally done over a sort of a John and Yoko museum type of place. When I went, it still resembled what it looked like when you see all the pictures of the Montreal bed in and uh, just being in the room. Uh, which is the living room, not the bed. I think they reversed it for the bed, and they put the bed where the living room was. Being in that space where Give Peace a Chance was recorded is pretty magical. Number two for me, and this is just a fleeting photograph memory, being in the Palace Movie Theater in the Bronx, in part the Parkchester section of the Bronx, to see Let It Be. Now, Ken saw Help, Al saw Hard Day's Night, Darren saw Let It Be, you might say, big deal. But I was five uh, and had just turned five a couple of months before. And I remember, and this is uh, an indication of what the Beatles were going to end up meaning in my life, that I remember for some reason that morning my mother saying, do you want to go see Let It Be? And being in the theater with a vague memory of them, them being up on the screen and the girls that were sitting behind us were laughing about something. And I thought they were laughing at the Beatles. So I'm um, this five-year-old that leans over to his mother and goes, why are they laughing at the Beatles? Shh, Darren, they're not laughing at the... And uh, the, last, the last memory for me, the last key memory, was the anticipation leading up to the broadcast of the Beatles anthology special on ABC. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I, well, I'm sure what pushed that one off the charts was knowing that at the end we were going to hear a new Beatles song. Yeah. And again, I was five when they broke up, when Let It Be hit the theaters. So for me, 
the concept of a new Beatles song was about as surreal as possible. And I remember being anxious and tense and nervous all day that Sunday. And I was home all day long. It was a, a nothing day. But knowing that at night, this much talked about documentary was going to start airing. Uh, and this was in right that Thanksgiving week, 1995. I remember 1010 Winds, the old news station, one of the old news stations in New York City, uh, 1010 WINS. One of the headlines all day was... Tonight, part one of the anthology documentary on ABC, and we will hear the first new Beatles song in 25 years, right? right. Math, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And that was just off the charts. And I still remember sitting there with that countdown that they had yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the countdown to the song. And when it started, initially, I remember that first drum beat thinking, sounded like ELO. But then <laughs> that, that, that was just a fleeting. I was just like, oh, my God, it's the new Beatles song. And uh, that was just um, magical. Funny story later in the week, then, I think what ABC did was Monday night was Monday night football. So part two was not going to be shown on Monday. And I don't think it was Tuesday. I think part three was Wednesday. And part, no, part two was um, broadcast on Wednesday. Part yeah. three was Thanksgiving night. Right. Problem. We were going to be at my in-laws' house for Thanksgiving. Uh, I wasn't even married yet a year. And I had a problem because we lived in the Bronx. My wife's family lived way out on eastern Long Island in Suffolk County in Shirley. That's well over an hour drive. How was I going to be home to watch part three of the anthology by, I guess, nine, maybe eight? And I actually said, we're leaving your parents' house. We have to. We're leaving your parents at six or whatever time. And uh, that was maybe the first uh, nuclear war in my marriage. <laughs> well, <laughs> leaving Thanksgiving early so he's going to go home and watch a television show. Can't you tape it on the VCR? No, no, no. I can't. I got to be there to, you know, experience the whole thing. And uh, and those are my three things. I mean, of course, professionally getting to interview Ringo Starr uh, and uh, some of the Beatles sons, uh, you know, Julian Lennon twice, Danny Harrison twice, James McCartney interviewing the Quarry Men. I had a very brief mm. interview uh, with Sean Lennon, which kind of wasn't as memorable of an experience. Uh, I though I treasure those, but something about the magic of the three, you know. Being in Abbey Road, being in the bedroom, being in the crosswalk, seeing Let It Be, and remembering it, and I was five. And, uh, you know, the anthology broadcast and the hype and the whole anticipation, those those, those I'll never forget. Uh, those are great memories. I was just thinking, when is the last time when the debut of any song was an event? I, I remember it. If, well, if I remember correctly, it was more of an event, at least... I remember, I don't know why I remember hearing it on 1010 Winds during the after, in the afternoon. I think it was more of an event that they were going to play the song mm. than ABC Broadcasting Part 1 of the three-part new Beatle documentary. Yeah. Probably I We Are the World was the, other, the only other one that I can remember that was like the debut of it was an absolute event. Really? Mm. I have no recollection of that. I remember in the wake of 9-11 that the... the uh, television broadcast that every network had but i right. don't remember we are the world for some reason but i, I don't say you're i, I agree I, i'm sure it was alex just for some reason you know i turned turned away or wasn't whatever i know that there were michael jackson videos that were events when they debuted but as far as just premiering a song you know yeah i can't remember one since free as a bird you know and, 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 and I actually like Real Love. It's about the same. I go back and forth which one I've liked more. And, and I love both songs. And they're Beatles songs in my book. And they belong there. And they should be heard with all the other Beatles songs. That's my opinion. Uh, I kind of felt bad for Real Love because it was by that point, there was no way that Real Love was going to live up to you know any hype. Any, you know, Free as a Bird was... You know, and I still get chills when I hear Free as a Bird because it just, it, you know, the way it, you know, I remember all of the uh, 
the anticipation and the excitement and it really does sound to me like Johns was with us and coming from another place mm. when he recorded that vocal. That wasn't a cassette done in his apartment in the late seventies. That was John channeling in the studio live with the Threedles and Jeff Lynn there, you know. Mm. All That's right. That. Any uh, any more comments? Actually, I've got a uh, kind of an off the wall uh, question for you guys. When uh, when I would uh, when I would be the moderator of a particular show, uh, I used used to kind of intro it uh, by saying the things we said today with our our virtual roundtable. And in my mind's eye, I have you guys at particular positions <laughs> and like i'm or i'm here alan is off to my, just to my left steve then is off to uh alan's left as you go around and then all the way around on the on the right hand side but across is darren and then am i ken, sitting upright yeah <laughs> and then ken is to my right, you know, at the, you know, kind of perpendicular between Darren and me. And I'm just curious if you guys at any, either if you always do, or at any point, if you, you know, when you're, when you're recording the show, if you have ever had that kind of thing in your mind's eye of where everybody is, or if it's just simply, you know, they're somewhere else. Hmm. There have been occasions. Now, this is just uh, obviously everyone listening. There is no video. Uh, right. There have been occasions that Alan has flipped on his camera. We've done a couple of shows where you could see Alan. Right. And once he dozed off and fell off the chair, which was pretty funny. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It. Uh, but other than that, no, I actually picture. You know what it is for me? I seen Alan flip on you know a couple of times like I said his camera during our shows, and Ken does talk more talk. So mm -hmm. I watch them, uh, and that's a podcast with uh, what do you call it? A video podcast? It's a video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I know what Ken would be doing. So mm -hmm. I, you know that visual has actually been uh, I, I have it already, and I'm very thankful that you guys can't see me uh, <laughs> laying in bed see. with my leg in a brace, uh, elevated. I think that would be fun to see. No, I'd see it yeah. with children. Uh -oh. <laughs> and everyone gets to see how messy my den is. <laughs> What's in those boxes? It's all stuff through the years that I've accumulated. Okay. And a lot of it's from all my beetle work. You know, I've got stuff from WDHA from my years there in this den. And notes from those years. <laughs> See, my stuff's scattered all over the house. The bathrooms are the only rooms that don't have my stuff in it. Much to my wife's dismay. I can say that now because she's not here. But anyway, uh, it was a thrill for me to get to do a show with Al and with Steve because uh, I listened through the years and, you know, as a fan and never anticipated the day come that, uh, you know, I'd end up on the show. You were a guest uh, a number of times. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's true. But never, I never thought I would end up being part of permanent part of the show. So this was a lot of fun to actually uh, be a host and have you guys on uh, at the same time. Well, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, it was it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate Ken inviting us. Yes, well, absolutely. I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're both such a big part of the history. I mean, Steve and I started the show. Where would we be without Steve and you, Al? That's so. And we've we've built up an audience after all these years because of the relationships that we've had together in this show and people becoming familiar with each of us, you know, and uh, the chemistry that we've had together. So we owe a lot to both you guys. Uh, for all your contributions all these years. And um, it goes without saying, anytime you want to be a guest on the show, just let us know. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. Okay. Will yes. do. Well, thank yeah. you. Okay. So why don't we go around and give everybody our contact information? Uh, we'll start with you, Steve. 
Well, um, I, I'm available on Beatles News and Information on Facebook. I have my own personal page, but uh, I will warn you that it's not all music, um, as some people have complained to me about my some of my postings of politics, but that's the way that goes. But I do have, uh, if I can plug it, I, I do have a, a, my own little podcast called Beatles News Briefs, and the contributing editor is uh, somebody you all know, Candy Leonard, and we have uh, some interesting discussions about about issues uh, from her perspective as well as mine. But anyway, that's uh, available wherever you find your podcast. And I will shut up now. Thank you again, yeah. Ken. Thank you again, Ken, for inviting me and Alan and and Darren. It was good to be with you. And Al, it was good to yeah. talk to you again. Absolutely. So, and, and Steve, your new show is also heard on Fab Four Radio. Yes, it is. It's also on Beatles Arama. Okay. Very good. Al, how about you? Uh, it's pretty much uh, what it's always been. Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, uh, and on Twitter, at ASUSS49. And I'm also still uh, still involved with uh, the Fest for Beatles fans and uh, uh, will be convening in Chicago in about three and a half weeks. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're gonna, you guys are going to miss Mark Lewison. And Jeremy Clyde and Alan. Um, see what happens when you're when you're when you, when you get close to seventy. <laughs> well, the good thing about this show is Alan that White. We, That's his name. <laughs> we we can edit whenever we want. Yeah, but I'm not and, editing this. Uh, <laughs> and the and the three wingmen, they'll also be there. Okay. You know. But uh, but yeah, the the easiest uh, um, way to reach me is uh, either on Facebook or uh, um, or Twitter, and uh, I pretty much just do the the usual almanacky stuff that uh, that I've been doing now for God about ten years now, I think. Mm. Time flies. Sure does. So there we oh, are. and I forgot to uh, I forgot to mention Beetle Fan. Uh, because I'm still very much involved with uh, with Beetle Fan. In fact, I've been probably busier there since I since I left things we said today than uh, that I had been in uh, many years. And uh, and so if you you know uh, you know obviously you can um, contact me through uh, through Beetle Fan www.beetlefan.com. Uh, Doing a lot of archive work. Uh, these days, uh, I just finished a, doing a piece on how Beatle Fan covered Ringo and Paul's return to the road in 1989 and 90. Mm-hmm. Mm. And uh, and then next will be uh, apropos of what uh, Darren was just talking about, uh, how we covered the the whole anthology project. I and, probably will uh, be in that one. <laughs> oh, you'll absolutely, and you're also you're also in the uh, the one on the the the, uh, the back to the road uh, mm. one, and you were very much in in the uh, we did one on on how how Beatle fan covered the Beatles solo and as a group in the eighties, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, and that. Alan was yeah. very much a part of that. So, and and it must have it must have inspired Bill to go into the archives because he suddenly brought out a bunch of British invasion pieces that I had done for the sister publication, Anglophile, around 1988-89, and asked me if I wanted to like update those pieces. And uh, along with updating those, and part of that is in the, the current issue, uh, along with that, I realized that I hadn't done pieces at that time on either the Stones the Who or the Kinks, and mm. so I did uh, did a uh, did pieces on uh, the '60s work of those three groups. We you know really cut it off really with the end of the '60s, or else it would have been a much bigger project. Mm. So yeah. So anyway, so that's pretty much so. Uh, yeah. So Beetle Fan is the other the other big outlet these days. A lot of worthwhile stuff there to read. Wow. Um, and also, uh, you mentioned the fest before. Let's just bring up uh, the website, which is thefest.com. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, the fest in Chicago will be the weekend of August 9th through the 11th. Right, exactly. At the uh, at one of my favorite places in the world, the Hyatt Regency O'Hare. Mm-hmm. Okay. Alan, how about you? Pretty much the easiest way to get to me is on Facebook, um, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, I have a Twitter feed. Don't put an awful lot on it. It's at Cozen. And uh, you can hear me as well on my other sometimes. Uh, uh, I'm a guest frequently on Swinging Through the 60s. Uh, and the latest show, I think I mentioned it last week, uh, episode 29, they have a way to go before they catch up with us, uh, is all about She Loves You. And I thought it was, um, it's, it, I think it's the best one that I've been a part of, uh, of the Swing and very good. shows. Yeah, it was so much fun to do. Uh, it's with Craig Bartok, who's the guitarist in heart, and Richard Buskin and Eric Taros. Um, so there's that, and uh, you know, otherwise, you know, whatever I'm up to turns up on my Facebook page, one way or another. Um, if you want to reach all of us, you can send an email to things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. That's things we said today radio show, all one word, at gmail dot com. We also have a Twitter feed that's at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Uh, Darren, you are next. You can reach me. If you want to shoot me a direct email, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org org is uh, my email address. That's D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook and like my uh, radio page. Uh, please go to the radio page, not the one that's just Darren DeVivo. Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio is the Facebook page. And I'm in the middle right now. Uh, I don't know why I took this on. But uh, as we led the days led into Ringo's birthday, I started doing write-ups for all of Ringo Starr's albums, posts on each album. And I'm about close to halfway being done. And every uh, day or every other day, I'm popping up. Uh, a little write-up summarization on every album, and uh, I'm half done with the first All-Star Band album. That's where I'm at now. So you could go to the Darren DeVivo on WFUV.org Facebook page, uh, like it, and then check out the old posts and wait with bated breath for when the next one's going to get posted. And I've enjoyed all of them, Darren. And when you're when you're home every day because you can't do anything because you have one leg, uh, you take on things like this. So that's what i've been up to and that's where you can find me okay all right as for me you can always send me uh an email at every little thing at att.net my website is kenmichaelsradio.com i just did an interview with lawrence juber who as we've said here on this show is such a joy to talk to we can talk about such a range of topics of course i talk about his time in wings we do a little analysis between John and Paul as songwriters, and we talk about his brand new CD, which is called Downtown. And it's all uh, pop and jazz standards of the pre-rock era, plus one original song. Downtown is the Petula Clark hit. And I'm starting to give away copies of the CD on my website through my trivia page, Beatles Trivia and Games page, that is. And it will also be uh, included in a special contest with Denny Sidewell's last CD, which I'm packaging together, which is called Boomerang. And uh, he covers Live and Let Die. And that. So that's on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay, before we go, I just want to send out a shout out to a couple of people. Mike Lynch, who has been a guest here on the show, who many years back gave us the wonderful theme that we use at the start and end of the show. Thank you, Michael. And also to Matt Burley at Fab Four Radio for carrying this show for many, many years on his wonderful All Beatles channel. And, of course, we have to thank all of our listeners for their support all these years. Whether you're a brand new listener or whether you go all the way back to the days of just Steve and me, we greatly appreciate your support of this show. And um, 
there's nothing like having fans that uh, tune into you. And it's, it's really something special that um, I don't think any of us take for granted. When you think about how much time everyone could spend for their entertainment value, the fact that some people actually spend an hour or longer every week or every other week listening to us is such a compliment. And we want to thank all of you who listen for that. It's a privilege to be doing this show. And I just want to thank all of our listeners for, for tuning in when they can. And uh, please spread the word about this show and about all of us and all we do. Okay? So I just also want to thank all of you for listening to this show, for going on for more than two hours. It may very well be the longest show we'll ever do, but we want to thank you for that too. So happy 300th episode, guys, and to all of our listeners. And for Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Darren DeVivo, and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michaels, thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Next time.